I'm going to vary a little from the text here. Yes, you could start with JPEG images, but any kind of serious astrophotography and processing you're going to want to do with your camera set to RAW. So starting out, if you're taking some pictures and it turns out that you like what you, you get, you're going to wish that you had done it in a RAW format for better processing options. So it's better just to start out with, with RAW. I guess I'm also going to argue a little bit about the ISO. It really depends on your camera, specific camera, what the best ISO is to use. And you'll find a lot of different people talking about using 400 or 800 or something. Like everything else, I guess it's a, the balance, but you're trying to use an ISO that has relatively low noise and is as much of a one-to-one -one ratio between the actual signal that comes in and what gets recorded as possible. Uh, for my camera, my DSLRs are T3Is. I did a lot of research and looking at graphs and charts and whatnot on the web and I finally settled on ISO 1600 as a good compromise. So I think for most modern cameras, a little higher ISO like 1600 is probably a good place to start. Yes, you need to be in manual or bulb mode and to get an exposure longer than 30 seconds, you'll have to have some kind of a release device, an intervalometer or something that plugs into the remote shutter port. But I would argue that you probably just want to jump right into using computer software. I mean, even the software that came with your camera, connect your camera via USB to your laptop and using, uh, in the case of Canon, you know, EOS utility, you can connect to the camera and operate the camera. It's called tethered, tethered photography, and you can control all aspects of the camera from the computer, and that'll get you started. Or there's certainly a lot of inexpensive software for doing astrophotography with DSLRs. I recommend Binary Rivers uh, Backyard EOS or Backyard Nikon. And that's what I use for my DSLR. CCD images are always going to be saved in this FITS format. That's a international standard for astrophotography files. So that's that's what you're going to do. Exactly how you operate that will depend on which program you're going to use. I guess probably Sequence Generator Pro would be one of the low, less expensive ones to look at, but there's Nebulosity and Maxim DL and lots of programs for operating CCD image, imagers. I have Sequence Generator Pro. If you're looking for something that's going to both run your camera and run your mount and plate solve and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then Sequence Generator Pro is something that can pull all the pieces together. It's probably a little complicated for beginners. It's nowhere near as easy to operate as Backyard EOS or Backyard Nikon for DSLRs, but it is what a lot of the CCD imagers use. So how do you figure out what your exposure time would be? There's no hard and fast rule because it's going to depend on all these different factors. What is the light pollution? How well is your tracking? Are you auto-guiding? What is your sensor noise? How bright is the object? How bright are other things around it? But in general, if you're not auto-guiding, you're going to have to keep your exposure times to less than two minutes. So that might force you to bump your ISO up higher than normally we would like for, for noise reasons. If you are auto-guiding, then the exposures are typically between 3 and 10 minutes. For, for my rigs, it's typically 8 minutes. So it's kind of down to, to trial and error with, with your rig. But on the right here, I've pasted in a little section from my checklist of how to go through the whole process, and it shows this concept of exposing to the right using a histogram. So whether it's the 
histogram on the back of your camera or the histogram in your camera control software. In this case, I'm showing a screenshot from Backyard EOS. What you want to do is increase your exposure time until you have a little bit of gap between the base of the histogram mountain there shown in red and the left-hand side of the histogram. And that guarantees that you're exposing above the, the sky fog or the light pollution and you'll be able to, to deal with that when you go and process your images. If you have that mountain too far to the right, then you're starting to compress your data and you'll have a lot more saturated stars than you probably want. So, you know, this idea of one-third to one-half of the first third of the histogram as a blank is a good thing to shoot for. Again, for, for my rigs, that usually comes out to be uh, eight minutes at, at semi-dark locations. If there's a lot of light pollution or if I'm not using a light pollution filter, then it might be quite a bit less, but then the results are not going to be as good because you've got all that light pollution to, to deal with. How many exposures then do you want to take? The more the better. Basically, the more data you can collect, the better your image, your final image will be because you're going to stack all of these up and use the multiple images to get rid of the, the hot pixel noise, reduce the light pollution, etc., etc. And so basically you're just you're increasing the signal to noise ratio the more you can have. As a minimum, 10 to 20 for color cameras, for, for mono cameras, 20 luminance, 10 red, 10 green, 10 blue. I think I've done 9 or 10 of each of the LRGB and narrow band would be similar. But you know, if you go and you look at these amazing photos online, you'll often see hours and hours of exposure time, the total exposure time, right? So lots of, maybe lots of five minute exposures added together. And then they'll often list on, on Astrobin or other places, you know, it'll say, 240 minutes of green, 240 minutes of blue, etc. The more you can get, the better, basically. And th these are called light frames to distinguish them from all the other types of frames that we'll talk about next. So in contrast to light frames, you have dark frames. So this is one of the, the calibration files that you'll want to take. And DSLRs, modern DSLRs, usually have a in-camera dark frame subtraction for long exposures. You're probably going to want to turn that off and manually deal with, with dark frames so that you don't waste your time under the night sky with a, an exposure taking twice as long as you set it for because of the dark frame subtraction. It's going to take a second image with the shutter closed of the same duration and then subtract it. So you turn that off in the camera menus and deal with it separately. So dark frames are the same exposure length, same temperature as a light frame, same ISO, but with the lens cap on the camera, the lens cap on the telescope, what, whatever you need to do to block the light from getting to the, the camera. And the idea is that you're trying to then subtract out by subtracting the dark frames any hot pixels or other thermal noise that's uh, accumulated on the sensor. So typically you want again between 10 and 20 dark frames that are recorded at a similar temperature at the same exposure and ISO that you took your light frames. Again, you don't have to do this every time. You can build up a library of dark frames and you can do it when the camera is disconnected from the scope by putting the lens cap on and covering the, the viewfinder probably to keep light from leaking in there and maybe put it in, in with some uh, desiccant to keep a condensation from happening, put it in the, the refrigerator or in an ice chest to achieve the same temperature that you, you're getting at night. So just take a bunch of darks at 
the exposure and ISO setting and build up a library of different temperatures. And then we can, I'll tell you how to select those back from your library in the deep sky stacking videos. Okay, so that's darks and that's what they look like if you were to look at them. Talk about filters. If you're using a color camera, you probably want a light pollution filter. If you're using a mono camera, then you're going to need at a minimum red, green, and blue filters to create color images. And of course, then that's for broadband. For narrow band, you want these specific filters for emission lines that are common in nebulas, hydrogen alpha, oxygen 3, sulfur 2. And then when you go to process those images, you can assign them whatever color you want. There's sort of a standard or a default, which is called the Hubble palette. And when you see the Pillars of Creation is a famous uh, Hubble Space Telescope picture. And they use this particular mapping where they assign the S2 data to red, uh, the HA data to green, and the oxygen-3 data to blue. Those are different from where those actual emission lines are on the spectrum. HA and sulfur would, would really both be red, and the oxygen-3 is right between blue and green. But in order to separate out that detail and make things stand out, then you use this Hubble palette mapping. So here's some narrow band versus broadband of the same object so you can get an idea of what the different uh, techniques could look like. And so if you've got these filters, you need a way to swap them in and out without taking your camera off the optical train. So there's manual or motorized filter wheels that can hold your filters and swap them in. Okay, um, another type of calibration file is called flat frames. And this you have to do with your camera on the scope in the same orientation exactly, same optical train, same everything as it was while you did your lights. Because the purpose of the flat frames is to take out any vignetting, any dust, any uh, other optical aberrations that you have in your specific rig and if you think about it if you take the camera off and put it back on it's not going to be in exactly the same orientation and so there's going to be some rotation between a, a dust donut on a filter and the, the camera between those two times so flats are something that you do have to do uh, typically at the end of the night or the next morning if you haven't taken your camera off your scope you can take your take your flats. Now, I, I tell people not to worry about flats when you're just starting out. You know, there's enough complication in astrophotography without stressing about the flats. But So don't worry about it when you start out. When you're ready to deal with flats, there's a number of different ways to uh, take them. I use the white t-shirt method, which is where I just put a doubled over t-shirt stretch it across the front of the scope, hold it on there with my dew shield, and, and just have the telescope in the home position pointed at true north, and just in the morning, then when it's light, I just use the light of the sun then to create that those flats. Now people will argue that that's not the best method, and there's all sorts of very expensive and detailed procedures and equipment to do that, but that's an easy way to, to start out. So take about 20 flat frames with even illumination and, and as it describes here.